announcements. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's a good announcement. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other birthdays? We have two. Do I have three? Just got through having one, yeah. You guys have birthdays the same day? <laughs> okay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Okay, the uh, Blasky funeral will be this Thursday at 10 o'clock at the Onega Community Center. Other announcements? Is that our first song? What? Father, we thank you that we can come and worship you, that you are worth our time and you've revealed yourself to us. We ask that all that is said and thought in this hour would glorify your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Let's have a youth message. There it is. We've got it. You want to stand right up here so we can see that? Thank you. Ready? Zechariah 4, 6. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Zechariah 4, 6. Okay, on day 5... God made all the sea creatures. And one of those sea creatures is called a turtle. And they're pretty big turtles. They grow pretty good size. They can live to be 100 years old. I got some pictures. I'll let you see. And here's one coming up on shore there. Now, when a turtle, a turtle lays its eggs in the sand. It scoops out a big place in the sand, lays its eggs, then it covers it over. And when the eggs grow big enough to hatch out, they will climb their way out of the sand and they'll head for the sea. 
and they know which direction. They're not confused. They know how to get to the sea, though they've never been anywhere in their life. Not only that, but they can, uh, after they get into the sea, they'll go 1,500 miles or more to get to a feeding ground where they'll stay most of their life. But when it's time to lay eggs, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. When it's time to come back, and they haven't been back for a long time, for, for years and years they haven't been back. But all of a sudden, they start swimming back and they land on the very beach they were born on. It's a big world. If I set you out in the ocean, <laughs> you would not land on, on the same, if I, you know, I put you on the ocean, you took off like from San Francisco and you went out there and, and then uh, several years later, you take the boat and come back. You probably wouldn't land in San Francisco, although it's a big area. But these turtles can find a little island that they were born on and they know exactly where it's at and they go to it. Scientists are tr still trying to figure out how do they do that? Well, that's all programmed. Okay. There's a lot of things that turtles can do that are very interesting. They can hold their breath underwater. How long do you think they can hold their breath underwater? At least, few, at least like a year. Does well, not quite, not a year. They have to breathe because they're like us. We have to breathe. How long can you guys hold your breath underwater? Five minutes? Five minutes? Maybe ten. Ten minutes? Ten. Well, if you guys hold your breath five or ten minutes, I'm, I'm going to have to pull you out because you'll be, you'll be floating like a dead fish. You can hold your breath if you practice maybe a couple minutes, but then you have to get some air. So we can't hold it very long. A turtle can hold its breath for five hours underwater. It is a long time. Five hours. See, that would be four o'clock this afternoon before it came up to get a breath. A turtle, sea turtle, they're called green turtles, and they eat vegetation, kelp and seaweed and stuff. And they go around. Um, <laughs> we call those things. They surround a, an island. Coral. Phew. They get around coral and they eat the algae off the coral and they eat the seaweeds and all that growth of coral. Unless it's a, a different type. There's two different types of main sea turtles. And that one, its favorite food is jellyfish. It loves jellyfish. Imagine a couple, couple of, well, jellyfish is, is a creature that it looks like it's got a balloon almost and then it's got little feelers down here. It doesn't have a brain. It can sting you, yeah. I always wonder what a natural enemy of a jellyfish would be. Well, that's a turtle. I've seen the video. It would hurt you really bad. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the most dangerous one is the box jellyfish. It is. It could be. Yeah, I don't know. But if, it came, if one of these turtles came across it, it'd just be lunch. And it wouldn't hurt it. What happens if you take and you put your hand on a, like a box turtle? Land turtle. Jump. Jump. Will anything happen? Yeah, he might try to bite you, so you have to be careful. Jump. Well, a snapping turtle would. A snapping turtle. How about just a regular box turtle? Probably not. Well, like what would it do? <laughs> well, the ones that I've been around put their head inside their shell. Okay? For protection. Super Speedo? Yeah, I see the movie. I don't know. Okay. Sea turtles can't put their head in their shell. Mm -hmm. It stays out. There's lots of things. Very interesting. And they have a built-in radar system that tells them where to go without ever learning it and tells them how to get back to their place of birth. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Did he eat it slowly? Uh, overnight he does. Okay. Because <laughs> when we come out when it's day, his food is just disappeared. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When you were out camping, um, I wanted uh, to let him go because I feel like he'd been at our house for like a while. For yeah, I didn't really want to go to the contest for sh for turtles race. Yeah. Well, turtles are pretty interesting. God made so many interesting creatures just for our pleasure. Okay, okay let's say our passage again. Zechariah 4, 6. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Zechariah 4, 6. Let's pray. Father, thank you very much for your love for us and all the things you made and you programmed perfectly. Help us to understand that you have a plan for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. And without Bible teaching in the soul, it is possible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that God exists as a rewarder, and he becomes rewarder for those who seek him. Let's seek the Lord in the 12th chapter of 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles, chapter 12. We'll read the first four verses. After Rehoboam's position as king was established and he had become strong, he and all Israel with him abandoned the law of the Lord because they had been unfaithful to the Lord. Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem in the fifth year of King Rehoboam with 1,200 chariots, 60,000 horsemen, and innumerable troops of Libyans, Sikites, uh, Cushites, that came with him from Egypt. He captured the fortified cities of Judah and came as far as Jerusalem. Let's prepare our hearts for taking God's word with silent prayer, confessing known sin, and asking God to open our minds that we might understand his word and apply it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can place a little bit more of our word, your word in our soul, so that it would become our word, that we would live it and understand it, understand your character, how you respond to things in this world and how we need to respond to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You notice that uh, this, is the, this is only the second generation after David. And they're going to lose all the wealth that Solomon collected in just the fifth year. Gone. They're going to lose it because they're going to be disciplined by God. God's desire is to bless your life, but he will spank his children if he needs to. Okay? He knows exactly what we're thinking and what we're doing in life. And he weighs our life in the scales, so to speak, because he desires for his children to live better, better than the world does, more loving than the world does, with greater compassion than the world does. And if we mimic the world, we are totally out of the plan of God for our life. Yes, we eat the same food and wear the same clothes, and go drive the same cars, have the same type of house as the world does. But we don't live for those things. We don't desire the things that distract us from God. There is a pattern among uh, the Israelites in the history of their country. They would 
Seek the Lord, turn to him, and then things would get better and things would prosper and then they'd turn their back on the Lord. And that's what we have here. Rehoboam, as I've said before, is a believer. But he's a believer who finds it hard to trust God in the circumstances of life. He could have trusted the Lord and the Lord said, I will make your dynasty as long as David's. That's quite a promise. But he never trusted the Lord. Every now and then he kind of leans that way. He's very much like believers who do not connect with God's word. Without connecting with God's word, we can't grow. Uh, he feels like he has strengthened his position. We're like that sometimes. Well, okay, I've got a, a retirement account or I've got, uh, I've got these things and I've got uh, the cars running, <laughs> you know, the house doesn't leak. I've got all this stuff taken care of and we feel like uh, things are going well and we forget that we are in the hands of a living God who loves us he wants to bless our life but please understand to bless our life he has to do that in the devil's world this is the devil's world Jesus made it very clear that the prince of the power of this air is Satan or the devil so bad things happen because this is his world and he can't handle it. And bad things are going to happen in the devil's world. And we're ambassadors. Our kingdom is in heaven and we're on planet Earth to represent our king. So when bad things happen, the first thing we, we have to acknowledge is, well, I am living in the devil's world. Bad things will happen. And then... Acknowledge that God intervenes in this world and blesses and takes care of us. God wanted to bless Rehoboam's life. But Rehoboam was too busy doing it himself. After five years, he had built uh, uh, fortifications all around toward Egypt because he could see that Egypt was an up-and-coming power. And he feels like things are good. He's, as it says here, he's, uh, he established uh, his kingdom. He had become strong. And then, when he's strong, he then abandoned the Lord. This is predicted for us in the book of Deuteronomy, how Israel will stray. And this is why even believers are called sheep. What do, what do sheep do? They stray, Okay. Yeah, we stray when times are good because we forget that our very life is hidden with Christ and God. So it says he and the nation strayed from the Lord. They literally, it says, abandon the law of the Lord. And in the book of Chronicles, that is the one phrase that keeps coming up to explain to the Israelites, as it's describing the history of Israel, to explain to them why it is they were taken into captivity and lost their land, their country, because they had abandoned the law of the Lord. They're unfaithful, as it says in verse 2, because they had been unfaithful to the Lord. So God sent a discipline. God knows how to spank, okay? Every kid's different, you know, in a family. With one kid, you have to get their attention and enforce what you're saying to them. With another kid, you look at them and they melt and cry. It's just different with each kid to varying degrees. And uh, God knows our soul. He knows, as our spouse knows, which buttons to push so he knows where to touch to get his point across. Imagine, they have untold wealth in Jerusalem that Solomon's collected for 40 years, eight different avenues of wealth, millions of dollars of each uh, in that each avenue, and it was all collected in Jerusalem. He had the 50 shields of gold, the large shields, 30, the small shields, 
but 20. And uh, there were solid gold shields. They weren't shields that you use in battle. These are ornamental shields that he would hang all over the place in his great palace, which looked like a forest when you walked into it. It was so huge. 30 pillars of trees upholding this huge structure, his personal house, his residence. And then there's a temple of the Lord and all the beauty of it and the gold and silver and whatnot. And, it, and they showed off their silver and their gold and all the riches that they had. And God sent Shishak, king of Egypt. Shishak even carves into uh, some of the uh, pillars in, in Egypt the different cities that he conquered in uh, Judea and bragging about it. He came with a huge army. It was just a large confederation army because everybody knew where the wealth of the world was. It was in Jerusalem. Solomon had been collecting for 40 years and they knew where the wealth was. The question is, could they possibly conquer it to get it? Now, when we are unfaithful to the Lord, He knows how to get our attention. And when He gets our attention, many times that's the point which we say, help me, Lord. Help me through this. Give me strength. Because when the pressure is on in life, Sometimes that's when we redirect our goals in life. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. If you love the world. Now we enjoy the world. This is the world that God made and we have it. Although we have Satan as the ruler of this world, yet there's a great deal of good that God allows us to have and to enjoy in this world. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the goodness of God in this world. But not to the distraction of the living God. There's a great danger in telling God, leave me alone. One day he will. And then you're not going to like that. And that's what we have in verse 5. The prophet Shemaiah came to Rehoboam and to the leaders of Judah who had assembled in Jerusalem because they're all assembling in Jerusalem because it's not safe in any other city and in the countryside for fear of Shishak. And he said to them, this is the same prophet that had given the instructions to Rehoboam not to attack Israel, the northern kingdom. This is what the Lord says. It's kind of interesting when you read in the word of God. And he will say, this is what I say, or this is what the Lord says. We live in a, in a uh, society that rejects truth, that everyone does what's right in their own eyes. They make up their own truth, that we have colleges and universities that teach lawyers and, and judges and congressmen and, and all kinds of people that you just make up your own truth. And so making up your own truth leads to what we have in, in Portland. It leads to what we have in Chicago. If you don't have a solid base for absolute truth, everything falls apart. It's impossible to run a country or have a family that runs with any semblance of decency without absolute truth. And that's what the Word of God gives. Unfortunately, and we see this happening more and more, in our country, there are a lot of preachers who have rejected absolute truth. They just want to, you know, do things the world thinks is all right. And so they take their standards. And everything falls apart then. They have no message for a lost and dying world that you can have eternal life by trusting Jesus Christ. Who said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. All who love the truth, listen to me, Jesus said. That's when Pilate said, oh, what's truth? Turned around and walked away. He wanted relative things. He didn't want truth. He was looking at truth, and he didn't want it. This is what we have in our society today. We have a lot of leaders 
who are governors, who are mayors of cities, and they just say to the police, well, just kind of hang back. It'll be all right. They'll get over it. <laughs> How stupid is that? Is that what you do? Is that what we do on a playground at school? Oh, just let them play. Don't, you know, don't bother with you know, the problems they're getting involved in. Would you let kids go out and play in a playground with no monitors? No, that'd be stupid. But we think we can do that because, you know, we're making up our own truth in this country. You see, once you have left God's word behind, you have nowhere to stand. You have nowhere to stand. Nothing is solid. Nothing can give you stability. And that's why the, the phrase, this is what the Lord says, is so important. God is the absolute knower of all things, and he knows how it works. And he gives us instructions how it works. And, and he says, now there's a boundary here. Don't step out of bounds. You'll mess up your life. I want you to be blessed. You have abandoned me, the Lord says. Therefore, I now abandon you. Ow. We don't want that to happen in our lives, but we don't stop and think, okay, what about the instructions and, and the loving commands that Jesus has given us? Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. And all this other stuff in life will be added to you. That's his promise. He can't lie. He will add. But he says, first seek my kingdom and my righteousness. And they listen to this man of God. He's a man of God because he speaks God's word. He's not a man of the people because he doesn't say what everybody else wants to say. He says what God says. And that's important. The leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves. This is interesting. Of course, they're in a corner, aren't they? I mean, this huge army is now at Jerusalem. What are they going to do? They don't have the resources to hold it off. So they humble themselves before God. That means confessing their sin and their rejection of the living God. And they said, the Lord is just. I've said that many times in my life. That's like saying, I deserve this. <laughs> this is exactly what I deserve in punishment because I did it. I am guilty, and God is disciplining me. And they're saying, the Lord is right in what he's doing here. We deserve this. Now, when any person humbles themselves before God, God accepts them unconditionally, unconditionally, which means they don't say, Lord, we did this. It's right that we're being punished, and we'll never do it again. That make them liars. No, they just humble themselves and say, God is doing what's right. The Lord saw that they humbled themselves. They confessed their sin. They admitted they were wrong and God was right. Since they have humbled themselves, the Lord says, I will not destroy them. But will soon give them deliverance. My wrath will not be poured out on Jerusalem through Shishak. They will, however, become subject to him so that they may learn the difference between serving me and serving the kings of other lands. Perfect discipline. Well, we don't want to listen to you, God. We don't want to listen to your word or follow what you say. God says, okay, you don't want to follow me. I'll let you follow one of the nation's kings and you could be subservient to one of the kings of the nations. Let me know how you like that. They're not going to like it at all. Because in the Lord, he was very patient. He put up with a lot. Uh, and they had turned from the Lord and they refused to follow his word. And God was patient with them and patient with them. And he still let them have their freedom. And they had tremendous freedom in their country. And then they decided, we don't need God. Let's go another direction. And they did. And when you turn from God, it always leads to immorality in your life without exception. It will always lead to immorality in your life. 
and they were acting very immorally. And God says to them, okay, go ahead. Be under the rulership of a king of another nation. Let me know how you like it. There's no freedom there. They're going to have to pay taxes to this king for years and years and years. And of course, to prevent this great confederation of armies from overwhelming and destroying Judah, they have to take all the wealth that Solomon collected for all that time. Just the shields, the shields, as I said, weren't for fighting. They're just, just to show uh, gold, and gold doesn't tarnish. It always shines like gold. It's been estimated $53 million worth of gold just in shields. And there's all the treasure that was in the temple. There's all the treasure that was in the palace. There's all the wealth that was in the, the nation. And they gather it all up and they make an agreement with Shishak. We'll give you all this money if you'll leave us alone. He says, I'll tell you what, you give me that money and then you pay high tax as long as I'm around and I'll leave you. I won't destroy your, your country. When we put anything in front of God, God can take that away. If I put my children in front of God, they're more important than God. God can take them away anytime. Or my spouse. Or whatever. You know, all of us are just here courtesy of the Lord. He gives us the breath we have. He gives us the opportunity to keep on going. He can take it away any way he wants, anytime he wants. So it says here, when he attacked Jerusalem, he carried off the treasures of the temple of the Lord and the treasures of the royal palace. He took everything, including the gold shields Solomon had made. So King Rehoboam made bronze shields. Now, bronze when it's polished, looks like gold, but it's not gold. And so they made all these bronze shields, and they didn't hang them up everywhere because, you know, they tarnish, and you have to keep polishing them to keep them bright. So they're not going to put them up where people can see them and see them fading and not looking gold color. So they put them in a guard house and they have it all guarded. And when they have special occasions, they'll take out these shields and they'll have all these servants of polishing the shields up to make them shine like they're gold. It's all for show. And this is true of many believers' lives that it's just a show. It, that they're just involved in ritual or whatever it might be, but the spiritual life is gone. It talks about this in 1 Timothy when it talks about the fact that there will be people who are lovers of self, lovers of money, etc., who have the appearance of religion. They have a veneer of religion. They have polished brass, not gold. But they have no power. The Holy Spirit is not a power in their life, not an influence in their life. And that's what we have here, it's the same thing. Because Rehoboam, in verse 12, humbled himself, the Lord's anger turned from him. And he was not totally destroyed. Indeed, there was some good in Judah. That's a great passage. You remember all the priests and the Levites who loved the Lord and loved the Lord's work? They migrated down to J Judah from Israel, the northern kingdom. Because they wanted to be near where the word was taught. They wanted to be near the temple where they could worship. They were the good. That was the remnant that preserved the land. Without it, it would have been wiped out. Remember Abraham? When he's asking, well, if there's 10 people in Gomorrah who are righteous, will you spare the city? And the Lord Jesus said, sure, I'll spare it. Okay, what if there's only eight righteous? What if there's only whatever? You know, he just... He knew what he was doing when he got to the ten and stopped. Lot, a believer. His wife, he assumed, was a believer. 
He had four girls. He assumed his daughters were believers. Two of them were married. He assumed they would marry believing men. And two were engaged. He assumed that they would too be believers. Lot ends up leaving the area with himself and two daughters. That's it. See, God said, sure. Even 10 people in the Sodom and Gomorrah area would be enough to influence the area to turn to the living God. There weren't even 10. And that's the teaching in the scripture about the remnant, the remnant of people that God honors and preserves the nation because there's at least a remnant of people left that he can use. When the remnant is too small to help the nation turn back to him, it is taken out. That's what we'll have in 300 years. It will be taken out. It gives the indication of what was going on in the book of Kings. In 1 Kings 14, it talks about how the sex cult religion had come down and Rehoboam had welcomed it into the land. And once you're away from the Lord, once you're walking away from him, you're walking in darkness. You're walking in the lust pattern of your sin nature. And you will become immoral. We all have our warnings from God and we all have our weaknesses and our strength. One of the great passages in the word here is that Verse 14, let's share that. He did evil because he had not set his heart on seeking the Lord. Okay. Rehoboam brought a lot of evil into the land. God waited, was patient, but eventually he had to discipline Rehoboam and that nation because it says he, he did evil because he had not set his heart on seeking the Lord. Now, what this is saying here, he had not, he did not, some others have, uh, he did not prepare his heart on seeking the Lord. How do you prepare your heart or how do you seek the Lord? You take in God's word. God's word gives you a motivation to do it right. A motivation to not fail. A motivation to do and stand where others will not stand. You have the courage to. A motivation to seek the Lord. The word of God is the key for any believer's life. He did not spend time in the Word of God. That's simply what it says. He didn't have, he's too busy. Oh, he's running a country. He's got an army. He's got somebody invading him. He's got all this stuff to worry about, okay? He's too busy for the Word of God. And God says, I want to bless your life. Let me. But when we say we're too busy, God will say, okay, it's your choice. What's my choice? And that would be evil in our life. We would consider the word of God not worth knowing. And he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for us, there are so many good passages in the word of God and we don't have to memorize them all or even a part of them. You know, Memorize the ones you enjoy. Memorize the ones that mean so much to you. And then take the rest of them and learn the principles of his word so that when you run across a situation, you say, well, you know, Israel ran across this situation and they trusted the Lord or didn't trust the Lord. I could trust the Lord. Anyone who turns to him, he accepts. Anyone. Just as these wicked leaders, when they humbled themselves, God answered and delivered. And so with us. Let's pray. We who are called by your name, Father, would like to follow you. We would like to be able to obey what you say and see the deliverance and blessing. Do not let us worship idols. 
Do not let us seek other things first, but let us seek you and your word that we may have your blessing in our life. In the kingdom you've given to us and that which is around us, may it be known as a holy place because we love the Lord first. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's share in communion together. All believers are invited and encouraged to partake. Receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, The cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, we are truly thankful that we can take time and honor you to know the very truth that you coming to this earth to prepare us for our heavenly journey to have our sins taken away on a cross, a very cruel cross, that we might have eternal life. And it takes this day that we can remember these things of what you did for us. And we are truly thankful. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
for mental stability and of course there are a lot of people here who are suffering from the loss of loved ones. Are there others we should be remembered? Pardon Mary Ann Moles. Mary Ann Moles. The last name is Moles. Okay. Why is under hospice care? Okay. Maggie McCord, her house, family, yeah, okay. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you care so much about us and you want a personal relationship with us. The spirit is willing and our flesh is weak. So we depend on your spirit to guide us, to keep us on track. Guide us at this time in our prayers. Let's all begin by thanking God for who he is, for what he is, for what he's doing in our life. give you the thanks father you do all things very well we thank you that if we turn to you you're there and you will never leave us and you will never forsake us and that you only want what is highest for us and best and we thank you if there's any sins we need to confess or someone we need to forgive let's do this right now Thank you for the forgiveness that is in Christ Jesus. Although we have confessed our sins many times, yet you have always done the same thing. You have forgiven us and cleansed us from all unrighteousness. 
we'd like to start off, Father, and ask that you guide us in our prayer on behalf of others. Let's be praying for those on the prayer list, those have been mentioned, and anyone the Holy Spirit brings to your mind. Father, we thank you that although we cannot, you can do all things well, and you can answer every prayer and meet every need, and we thank you that you are interested in these lives, that you want fellowship with these lives. May each come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Let's be praying for the three people you're praying for their salvation. Only you can save, open a heart, Father. We give you the glory and the honor and the praise for it. Pray for your spouse. Pray for your family. Pray for our country. And our president. Let's pray for the police in our nation. Give them courage, give them strength, give them wisdom to do the job of serving you and protecting this country. Suppress the evil arrayed against them. Give them the knowledge of a peace which you can give as they trust you. Raise up a new generation of those who are willing to serve you through protecting the citizens of their nation. We pray also, Father, for others who serve us, such as firemen, paramedics. We thank you that they're willing to serve, that they care about the lives of others. Continue to stir up in us a great love and compassion for people around us. Father, we ask that we would be good citizens, that we would benefit those around us, that in seeking first your kingdom and your righteousness, it means we're going to do good to others around us. Teach us how we can love you more as we love fellow believers around us. And teach us how to take care of those around us who are unbelievers. Be kind and considerate toward them, giving them a kind and respectful answer for the hope that is within us. Let's be praying for this congregation and believers throughout the United States.
Father, we know ultimately judgment will come to this nation. But we know that judgment will first come to the people of God. May we turn to you individually and collectively, giving our heart to you and acknowledging you are the Lord of heaven and earth. And you are our guide and our God. May that which we meditate on while we're at our jobs and at home be pleasing in your sight. May we step out of the carnage of this world and think on that which is good and pure and right. Give us the power, Father, for we don't have the power, but you do. Nothing is impossible with you, and your spirit can guide us into that life which is everlasting. Thank you for the walk we have. Thank you for the eternal life which is ours. Thank you for the future you have in mind for us. We give you praise. May we never stop talking with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As for the events of Rehoboam's reign from beginning to end, are they not written in the records of Shemaiah, the prophet, and of Edo, the seer, that deal with the genealogies? There was continued warfare between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Jeroboam rested, excuse me, Rehoboam rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. And his son, Abijah, succeeded him as king. It really doesn't matter how long we live, we're going to end, right? I mean, I may, the Lord may decide that's enough for me, you know, for Aura, and take me this way. And that's okay, I have a problem with that. And my wife does, because she, all the junk I got left behind. Anyway. <laughs> But all of us, all of us, without exception, are going to die. And what will be the summation of our life? Okay? Constantly at warfare, didn't trust the Lord, invaded, lost all the wealth of the land, etc. What will be on our tombstones, so to speak? Oops. <laughs> our future is in our hands as we make decisions for the Lord. And the Lord will take our decisions of trusting him and he will make it good for us. For he desires to be good to us, to show good to us, and to bless us. So anything we're working at this week, let's make the Lord a part of it. Let's sing our decision here together. 331 verse 1 standing on standing, please. See memory verse Psalm 5522. Psalm 5522. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Psalm 5522. And on the facing page this week, I will be faithful to my spouse. I will speak the truth in love. I will be courageous and kind. I will be thankful. Let's pray together. 
We would like to walk the walk of Jesus Christ, Father, but we can't do that without your word and your spirit. So enable us to trust you in all the details of our life this week, to realize that you're there and you make life worthwhile. You make it dynamic. You make it fulfilled. So may we walk with you this week. May you be glorified. All praise belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen.